Okay, so here we are. It's uh, Wednesday morning. We're at Outrigger Canoe Club, and I'm uh, here to have a chat with uh, old mate Clint Robinson. Uh, we go back a long way, as I've said in previous years. Um, and he's back here for uh, another Molokai race. Uh, how many of you? How many is it now? Or... Um, it's been a long time. I was only talking to some of, some of the people in my group last night, and I first came to Hawaii to do the ski race as a 16-year-old. 30 years ago, so my first race um, was quite a long time ago. I didn't get to do races every year because of the Olympics and all my kayaking preparations, but uh, I think this is maybe about my 12th or 13th ski race, and uh, I did the outrigger, the six-man ho, twice. So I've crossed the channel maybe about 15 times, I think, before this, this race this weekend. So back in Hawaii, mate, it's good. And what's the lure that keeps bringing you back? Um, I think as you would understand, because we've been around for so long, um, paddling is a beautiful sport, you know, you get to enjoy the water, you get to feel the waves, you get to feel the energy of wind and chop and the art of being able to go downwind, it, it's just such a beautiful sport to enjoy with no impact, so your body can keep doing it. And I genuinely um, love to paddle, that's why I'm still here, but I really do enjoy Tahiti and Hawaii are probably my two most favourite paddling places in the world, apart from my own home area that I've grown up in. So um, to come here each year and enjoy what I regard to really, no disrespect to any other ocean ski race, because I think there are a lot of good races, but nothing compares to this. Nothing. Yep. Really doesn't. They can have their ICF world titles and whatever they want. Excuse the noise yeah, yeah excuse the noise in the background there, but um, the reality of the situation is I just believe this not only is it the beginning of the sport, it's the what developed, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it keeps coming, it's what developed the interest of equipment for the sport. They designed a whole new range of paddling gear that all paddlers today get to enjoy. So really, Tim, it's just the backbone of the whole sport and it is the real challenge yep. race of the sport. Yeah, yep. I agree. Yeah, this old mate here is <laughs> setting up the breakfast is determined to set up right around us. But we're just going to keep rolling. I'm not going to edit this in the slightest. We just keep rolling. Through. That's right. <laughs> so, um, right. anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. It's, um, it's just even. It's not sort of. I don't know if it's part of it. You know, it's not. You know, there are other races that are. You know, there's a the world championships and all that. But this is. Look, I know from you know doing logistics and having people approach me about doing their logistics for this race and coaching people who come into the sport, this is bucket list. Yep. Everyone wants to do this race, whether no matter whether you whether it fits into their World Series or not, this is the one. Yep. Yep. Yep, I agree. Okay, so in the last few years that I've seen you, probably last four or five years, you've been really busy with, you know, working with schools and in their you know, high performance with their rowing programs and and you've come over, I remember, you know, you having done about I remember once you said I've done about nine or eighteen sessions yep. in the lead up so you were not anywhere near as fit as I know you'd like to be and you know one thing about having known you over the years is that your preparation is always really thorough and um, and so um, circumstances have changed and you're now uh, much better prepared I believe yeah. yes yeah look um, I finished my Olympic career in 2008 yeah. and had a bit of a crack at this race took a couple of years to get it right and then won 2010 2011. Um, had a little bit of a stuff up in 2012 um, when Oscar knocked me off that year and then won 2013 when Sean and I had a good battle. And ever since 2013, I've been running big rowing programs in Australia at school level, at private school level. So, you know, 180 boys, 400 people in the community of rowing in each school. Um, so it, it, you know, was 90 hours a week work. And the rowing program finishes in late March each year. Um, so I would get between three to six weeks preparation for this race since 2013. So I've never prepared for the race um, since 2013 until this year. So I've come back and done probably more paddling in the last six months than I've done in the five years between 13 to before I started for this year. So um, I'm definitely a lot fitter, about six to eight kilos lighter. And, uh, but I'm also older and, you know, all those things change too, but um, you know, yeah. Oh, mate, oh, mate, I'm getting close to 50, so you know, at the end of the day, that that does happen. But look, I'm feeling a lot better. I'm looking forward to the race rather than trying to survive the distance now. I know I can actually paddle the distance. Like last year, I was sitting about 100, 150 meters behind, sort of, you know, there was like Corey there, and I think it was Hank and maybe Jasper, and 
I was just sitting there going, well, I know that they're not going to really get away, but I can't really do much about it either because I've done no work. I yeah. paddled for like three weeks in one year. Yeah. So I just didn't have the chance to have a crack at them. But um, hopefully this time around we can make a better race out of it. And you're out to, uh, you know, what's your goal for this year? Yeah. Um, well, you know, it, it's funny, as you would know, when you get older, things do change, perspective yeah. changes. Um, when I was younger, like when we were paddling full on, I wanted to win every single thing that I raced in. Yeah. Whether it was on the water, off the water, it didn't matter. We were just Home young. Tennis. Yeah, <laughs> that's it, mate. Young bulls having a crack, you know. Yeah. Where now, we're definitely not that. You know, I have children and they're just far more important to me than paddling and things like that. So, you know, paddling's way down my priority list in terms of things that I need to do. But when I come to race, I'm a competitive person, so I'll do the best I can. Um, you know, if I feel like in the first two hours of the race things go okay, um, I'll definitely try and win it. There's no doubt about that. But, um, you know, everything, as you get older, you have a smaller window of opportunity. Yeah. The window's still there, but it's much narrower. So we'll see. We'll see. I really want to enjoy the race, but that's yeah. my first priority, you know. Well, the question I've got is, you know, given that you've done, you know, won Olympic Games, you've won Olympic medals, you've won multiple life-saving titles, you've won, multiple, you know, you've won most of the things you've you know, there is to, that you can do. As a paddler, you know, so many people will go and they, you know, they, when they start paddling, and, and our sport is people starting in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, this ocean paddling, and they're learning technique and what have you. When you're training, you know, obviously you're programming, you'd be comfortable with your programming over a number of years, but are you still constantly refining your stroke and yep. those sort of things? You know, when you train for sort of three to six weeks a year, you don't get a chance to do too much with your stroke. You're, you're really just trying to find the feel again for things, yeah. the ski, the ocean, the paddle and all those things. But now that I've done a little bit more, yeah, definitely um, in the last six months, I have put a considerable amount more energy into just finding certain things in my stroke for efficiency, for where my body now is, is now at. See, when I was young, like, you know, like these younger guys between sort of late teens to early 30s, I just... I only wish I had my body like that now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'm paddling as an older burnout now. Yeah. You know, I'm 20 years behind my best. And, but I just, yeah, as you know, you learn things about how you've got to adapt your body to fit with what's happening to you. And uh, that experience you can't buy. It's just time that you need to do to do that. But I'm always thinking about the technical form of my stroke when I'm on the water. That's how, as nearly getting close to a 50 year old guy, how I can still remain competitive with the best guys in the world. They train pretty much well most of their week, you know? I don't think, that, from my experience, I don't think that ever stops. Yeah, you know, yeah. That, that, and I think that's part of the, the, the attraction of the sport is, see how the old 10,000 hour rule to gain mastery over something, and, and when you do get to a point where you feel comfortable you know, that you, oh, geez, like, I think I really get this at a deep, deep level now. Yep. Like you said, I wish you knew that when you were a kid. Yes. Then it's actually, it's a pleasure. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's it's very rewarding. You're yeah. right. Yep, I agree. Yeah, okay. So um, what sort of, they're talking maybe a little bit of wind on the day. Yeah. Are you uh, aware of any latest forecasts today? Look, I sat down with Jeff Graff um, a night or two ago and we caught up and had a chat about his amazing adventure that nearly killed him out here a few months ago um, and uh, we were talking about what the conditions could be like it looks like it's going to be something in the teens yeah. if things stay the way they are at the moment which will give us some bumps yeah. the thing that a lot of people have to be careful of and I don't know how many people have read into it but I saw Luke Horder last night from the Sydney Club and I said mate you I know you've got a lot of paddlers that aren't like mega experienced you know there's probably going to be a five to six foot wave coming straight in on Molokai Beach on race morning. Mm. So for people that aren't aware of that and they're not prepared for that yet, that's something they should prepare for because yeah. the northwest swell hits that beach straight on and it's 1.8 metres. So for anyone that thinks they're going to have a nice easy get on their ski on race morning, that's not going to happen. Okay. So that's probably the first challenge for most people. Once we're out in the channel, mate, we're going to, looks like we're going to have a little bit of swell against us but maybe a little bit of wind behind us. Yeah. And we've got the tide basically against us for two thirds of the trip. So yeah, this year's race, I know why Earl's put up $5,000 for the, for the record holder for men and women, because he's pretty much all guaranteed it's not gonna happen this year. So <laughs> he's, he's quite a smart corporate boy doing that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he probably would've got nice good advice from Michael. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 I'm sure he did. Okay. 
Great. Well, any uh, any so you um, any advice or anything you'd want to say to uh, oh. the race or you know? To yeah. Look, I I think the key to this race in terms of the key to this race in terms of uh, completing it. There's two, two parts to this race that's become very apparent over the types of the field that are turning up now over the last two or three years is in order to complete the race as a solo paddler, you have to evaluate how long in rough terms you think it's going to take. And then you have to set up your nutrition to last that period of time. Because if you go out with your tank 95 to 100% full, you're freshened up, you're feeling quite good, and it's quite a hot day, and you keep grinding away, chasing runners, you know, you're getting tired, you're getting hot, you're starting to lose a lot of energy, and you aren't putting that back in, eventually your demise is getting closer to you all the time. So for people that may have thought about nutrition but not really, you know, spoken with their boat drivers or their support crew or whoever it is to help them across the channel, if you haven't done that in detail, have a really good think about it before you start the race because if it's quite flat, I've seen a lot of people here have a pretty tough experience because they just lost far too many, you know, en energy cells and they didn't put them back. I agree, couldn't agree more. And there are there are some old stalwarts of this, of this race who don't drink much. Yep. And if you're a newbie going into this race, don't try and copy that. No. Because they are unique. Yep. And they've done it a million times. Yep. Um, so yeah, don't copy that. <laughs> no, well, look, so here's a perfect example for you, Dean Gardner. We yeah. both know him very yeah. well. He's a yeah. great he's a great racer over here. He came through an era a little bit before this current era is here, but he still, of course, has competed very well in this current era. And Dean's got, there's been stories of Dean, they call him the camel, you know, he's basically paddled the race without water. Yeah. But everything, and I've always wondered why, because every time Dean would get close to Cocoa Head and the finish of the race, he was in these bad holes. Like, his performance would go down so far, he was so exhausted he could hardly make the finish of the race. Yeah. And I've thought, if that guy took in some more gas in the first hour and the second hour, yeah. because Oscar nearly every year they'd have a battle, would come over him at the end of the race. And yeah. Dean had the runner's ability, and Dean can paddle when he's ready to go in the flat, still quite okay. Yeah. But every year I've caught Dean coming into the wall, he was literally like throwing an anchor out. And I thought, a guy with that much ability, just with a little bit more nutritional support, could have given himself another leg at the back end of that race. But he, he hardly ever drank anything. Yeah. And I mean, no one in their right mind in any nutrition form or race planning strategy would tell you to ever do that. You know, because no triathlete would ever do that because your performance goes downhill. You can't keep working hard and not go downhill without nutrition. So, anyway. <laughs> yeah, but you know, but as I said, the respect for Dino as a competitor, like in his ability, him and Grant Kenny are the best two natural ocean using guys I've ever raced in my life. Their ability to feel and blend is amazing. And both of them weren't big, powerful men either. They were just really connected to what they did. But both of them, and even Grant Kenny, a week ago I was talking to him about this and he said, mate, I've done some crazy things to myself nutrition-wise and nearly carked it and all that sort of stuff out on the water in training. And he said, if I only knew what I knew today, I might have been a much better competitor in some of the events I did. And I think that's definitely Dean Gardner's case. I think, I think he would have won more than 10. Super natural. Yeah, and super, superly nat super natural in the ocean, definitely, definitely. All right, mate. Well, thanks for that, and I, um, I certainly, uh, you know, on behalf of the old blokes, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm cheering for you. And, ah, good, mate. Good. And uh, it'd be great to see you up there, uh, taking another one out. So. Uh, oh, mate, it'd be, it'd be great to have a good battle. You know, I mean, there'd be nothing better than be 10k from home, and uh, have three or four of us within sort of 50 meters of each other. That, awesome. that would be my dream to be able to get a test like that. You know, I, I love to race guys like Hank and Corey, especially a guy like Hank. He's an older guy now. He's yeah. about six years younger than I am, but he's an older guy. He's a hard nut, and there's nothing better to race people like that. Yeah. You know, you want a good hard fight, and uh, he's certainly the one that'll give you a good fight. So, yeah, we'll see, mate. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for your time, mate. All right. No Cheers. worries, buddy.